Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on how to develop a business plan in six easy steps, a simple approach to planning and execution. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our presenter today is John Harmon. More on John in just a minute. First, some brief info on SCORE. There's over 320 offices and 11,000 volunteers nationwide, and we're part of the SBA. SCORE Fairfield County has over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. First, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, Second, educational workshops and webinars, over 150 per year. And three, extensive resources on our website, including a network of experts and templates to help you fill out your business plan. SCORE puts on many webinars each month. Look for future events on our webinar calendar at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Some useful information about today's event. If you have any question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at 1 p.m. to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next couple of days. Now our speaker, John Harmon is Managing Director of Edulent Consulting Services which advises small and medium-sized businesses on strategies for growth and operating excellence. John has held senior leadership and executive positions in sales, marketing, quality management, strategic planning, and new business development at Eastman Kodak, the Gardner Group, and Pitney Bowes. John, it's all yours. Tim, thank you very much. Um, so, um, I, I first of all want to make sure you know that this is not going to be overwhelming. <laughs> we're going to try to make this simple for you, but I, I do want to be clear about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty moving my. There we go. Um, so, what we're going to discuss today uh, is what is a business plan? And I must say that my approach to this is not to have the, the idea of a hammer become the business plan, which is to say it's one use, one tool. Think of this as more of a Swiss army knife. There are a number of things you can do. Uh, you don't have to do everything all at once. Just that part of the plan that's most relevant, most important for you now. And we're gonna try to specify those pieces as we go through. Uh, I call it a six step. Uh, actually, it's more like a two step or maybe a three step, depending upon where you are in your process. If you're a startup, you probably don't have to get past the first step. If you're in business, you probably might want to focus on the fourth and the fifth steps. But it, a lot of it is up to you and you pick and choose what you want from this presentation. We'll talk a little bit about a bus monthly business analysis. There needs to be metrics. There needs to be an understanding what the goal is, how you measure your progress against that goal, and some of the things you're going to do to achieve that goal. And then finally, we'll end with a closing challenge. So uh, what's a business plan? Well, very simply, it's, it's uh, sales and earnings targets. You have to start with a target. And uh, while, of course, you need to put that target in financial terms, it's also a personal target. What, what, why are you in business? Uh, yes, to make money. Yes, to, to grow revenues. But there must be something else that you're trying to achieve. It might be that you're entering a business just to earn a little bit of mo money, just as a sideline. Or you're entering a business to, to make a million dollars or somewhere in between. But have some idea of what you want from this business. In this presentation, we're going to we're going to describe how you can achieve them. So once you set your targets, how are you going to do it? What are you going to do? Who's going to do it? When and at what cost? And then we're going to talk about monthly metrics. Six steps, very simply. First of all, you want to analyze your market and your business. For you startups, it may be the only thing you need to do initially, nothing else, uh, or maybe the, the, maybe the number two as well. 
Uh, but for those in business, you may want to focus more on uh, the second, third, maybe the fourth items. We'll talk more about this, but at least I want to include all the items so that every one of you can have something that relevant to, uh, to look at and discuss. First piece, market data. Um, what is your market and who are your customers? Most people entering small business are in what I'd call a mature business, which is to say a business that's been around. Uh, the services are roughly equivalent. The pricing is pretty well known within some uh, highs and lows. Uh, you, you can, ex the, 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 the business is standard well-known business. Uh, landscaping is an example or construction or retail or consulting. All these businesses are what I call mature. And as a result, most of you are gonna to have to worry about your strategy. We'll talk more about that. But your strategy in growing is going to be take share from somebody else or to try to prevent somebody else from taking your business. So that's part of what you need to think about. Uh, market size, um, that really, how you go about sizing the market depends on where you are. Uh, you may be a local business. You may want to understand roughly how many businesses there are in your geography. For instance, if you're in Bridgeport and you want to open a restaurant, well, how many restaurants are in Bridgeport? And what kinds of restaurants are in Bridgeport? Uh, if you're uh, more global, you may want to understand the uh, as an example, if you are in the consulting business, you may want to understand uh, how many businesses are are there to be consulted for. Uh, some so, some sense of size, um, and is this market growing, or is it stable, or is it declining? Entering a declining market is not a bad thing as long as you feel you can compete. But understanding where, where that market is and its growth potential is an important part of your strategy. And then finally, customer segments. We're gonna get into more of this later on, but for now, let's just say a customer segment is a business that has several different kinds of customers. They may, uh, they, they may look at different, uh, the similar products and services, but they have, may have diff slightly different needs. And we'll get into segmentation in a second. But recognize that in your business, there will be segments. There will be, uh, you're, you're, you might focus on certain kinds of segments right away because they're the easiest to find or they're the easiest to please. And you may have a strategy to get to other segments later, but it's important you understand those segments. Purchase drivers, what, what motivates customers to buy from you? Is it the quality of your product or service? Is it cost? Is it service? And service might be as simple as being able to bill quickly or to answer the phone quickly and reliably, but have some idea of what those drivers are. It's great. It's fine to be in a business where you're priced about where the competitors are. You offer relatively simple, the same products, but you are fast. You are responsive. Uh, there are uh, few errors in your business, and that may be the potential for what makes you different. Uh, demographics. Uh, this usually applies to the consumer business. What do your customers look like? Are they male? Are they female? Are they old? Are they young? Are they picky? Are they uh, uh, do, do they not care about the quality except for the price? Or what what, what do they look like? Uh, if you're serving businesses, well, what kind of businesses? Are they small businesses, large businesses? Are they in a particular kind of industry? Uh, do they, for instance, uh, offer a supply, supply chain service like logistics? Uh, it, it, is it, 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 are you in the retail and furniture business? What, what are those businesses like? And can you describe them in some detail? Distribution channels, what I mean by that is, how do you contact your customers? How do you convince your customers that what you do is worth their, their consideration? And how do you deliver your service? And the channels you use to first find the customer, 
may be different from the channel you use to convince the customer to buy, and it may be different from the channel you use to deliver. We'll talk more about that, but as, an, as a quick example, I may use the internet to find customers. Uh, I may have an SEO project that allows me, allows customers to, to at least find me more easily, but I may actually convince them based on my, a phone call or a visit or a brochure or something. And then finally, I may deliver that business differently. I could deliver it through the internet. There are lots of businesses that have uh, internet services, or services delivered through the internet, but others uh, may deliver it uh, through personal contact, through shipping services, whatever. But it's important to understand the distribution channels you're using, for what purpose, and how can you best use those channels to make them most efficiently work for you. There's seasonality and regionality. Uh, a good example would be the landscaping business or the construction business. Certain kinds of businesses are uh, uh, operate at full capacity during the summer and then wind down during the winter. Uh, many landscaping businesses, as an example, are in two businesses. One is landscaping in the summer and snow plowing in the winter. Whatever it is, understand that there's probably some seasonality or regionality in your business. Understand what that is and how you adapt to it. And then finally, key marketing drivers. We'll get into more on that in a second. Um, many of my clients ask me, well, well, that's that's fine, that's great, but how do I find out? Where, where do I go to get information? The internet, of course, is the most obvious answer. Um, you can find all sorts of things about the internet. As an example, if you're in the consulting business and you wanna understand what your price ought to be, in your, for your consulting service, say you're an accountant, or say you're an attorney, or say that you are in the business of providing business consulting advice, you can go on the internet and you can find businesses and you can find standard pricing for those. It may take you a while, but at least you'll understand what, what the range of pricing might be and where you might fall in that range. Public company reports, um, Particularly if you're ser serving businesses, you may want to find out more about those businesses because they could be suppliers to big companies, and you might be able to find out what who's what supplier service what uh, uh, what big business and what big business uh, how big business might rely on them. Um, the library is a great source. Uh, I, th I it, Many businesses don't understand, or many many of our clients don't understand just how valuable a business can be. Um, if you go to a, a, a business library in Norwalk or Stamford or Bridgeport or name your town, there'll be a business librarian. And if you, for instance, want an online source to understand all the businesses that are, that are in the region by name, that they can provide you with that. Uh, if you want to find out more about what makes a winning strategy for the retail business, you can find a book or an online resource to tell you that. There's also something called the RMA, which is the Risk Management Association. Uh, this is not for startups, but is a huge book filled with every business in the country. These businesses willingly provide their financial data to the RMA and have it posted. So you can go to the RMA under industries, let's just say retail. And if you want to find out what the profitability and revenue levels are for the specialty jewelry business, there's a category in there and it'll give you how uh, big the revenues are, what the profitability is, what the asset structure is, uh, you can find all, all sorts of things. And the reason you want to do that, you want to understand what the, the profit potential of your business is. And they structure these, these data by the bottom 25%, the middle 50%, and the top 25%. You can understand what the worst and the best of these businesses do. Uh, there is the government website, uh, Bureau of the Census, NAICS, North American Industrial Commercial System. Uh, it's, it's, it's a code that identifies every business in the United States with a number. You can understand all the businesses, what, they, what their name is. You can understand how many of them there are. You can understand where they're located. All that comes from 
the Bureau of the Census NAS, NA, NAICS codes. Trade associations, it shows for those of you just entering a business, uh, you may not be quite ready for that because these are business, these are uh, uh, these associations serve businesses in business, but they also can be an important source of information for what's going on in your in, in your industry. What are the highlights? What are some of the risks? What are the, some of the rewards? So at least knowing what's going on there may be useful as your business gets going. Uh, attending these shows can introduce you to vendors who are trying to sell these businesses. It can introduce you to other com your competitors and you ought to know them. It can introduce you to uh, potential partners that might assist you in your business development. Trade publications, uh, market research is uh, is expensive. Uh, it's not for everybody, but you may be in a position where you can go online and say, what market research uh, information is available? And uh, am I willing to pay more for what that market research might mean? And usually that suggests market size, segment sizes, trends in the industry, number of competitors, um, all sorts of data that can help you understand what your industry looks like. So, uh, that is your market data. It's also important that you understand your competitors. I have more than a handful of clients that tell me they have no competitors. And I try to be polite, but I usually come back to say, yes, you do. Of course you do. You just don't know it. Um, now, uh, so, so what you understand, you need to understand what your competitors are doing with respect to their target customers. Who are their customers? Who do they, what do they think their customers want? How do they meet the needs of those customers? What product ranges and features they might offer? There could be, for instance, businesses that don't directly compete with you, but could. So as an example, if I'm in the general contracting business, I may not think that a plumbing business competes with me. As a matter of fact, I might even use that plumber as one of, of my contractors. But that plumber might very well expand into general contracting, no reason why they can't. So understanding what your direct uh, competitors are and who your competitors might be is an important part of your analysis. What's their pricing? What kind of quality do, do they try to achieve? Are they the low priced guy? Are they, are they the, the high priced a uh, high quality guy or, or what? And what do they say about it? How do they describe their capability so that customers become interested in that? What's their size? What's their profitability? That's one of the things you can find out in the RMA reference guide. What are their service plans and reputations? By the way, most businesses have services, uh, w whether that's their direct product or not. A service might be billing. A service might be help desk. Service might be somebody who answers the phone when you call. But think about that because that's a, a very important, even though an ancillary part of what you offer, because sometimes if your service standards, service delivery is not up to standard, customers will leave you despite how good your product or, or direct service is. What's your marketing strategy? Um, or what's their marketing strategy? How, how, do they, how do they describe themselves? Where do they go to find customers? Uh, how successful might they be? And that gets into sales and channel strategies. And then what about credit? What are the ter payment terms? Uh, it's important that you consider payment terms because it's cash. And that's why you're in business. You're in business, of course, to make sales, but ultimately you're in the cash business and credit policies can very well affect uh, your cash flow. Uh, data sources are roughly similar to what we talked about before, the internet, there's, there's Google, there are the websites you can lo look at. You can also be a customer. Uh, for instance, if I'm, if I'm in the, uh, let's say the liquor business, I want to open a wine and liquor store, maybe I should visit a couple of my current competitors. They don't know I'm a competitor, All they, they think I'm a comp customer. Go in and find out what products they have on the shelf. What are their pricing? How easy is, is it to find things? How helpful might they be? So the, these visits can be extremely important. Restaurants are another example. Go in and have a meal at a competitor and see what you think of it. 
trade associations, publications, these are all the same things you did for your markets, uh, your market study. They can apply to competitors. Um, Dun & Bradstreet is, is a paid service. It's, there are a number of business services that are paid. You could consider uh, doing that, particularly if you're in business now. I wouldn't recommend it if you're just starting out because there are many things to learn besides what Dun & Bradstreet can provide you. So that's competitor data. Um, this is a tool that I am showing, but I don't know that it applies to many small businesses. This is a tool that large businesses use and they use it so that they can bring various parts of the organization that don't know what other parts of the organization do to bring together a view of the entire business. And it, it's not that it's unuseful for small business, but two things that you need to worry about, to think about. First of all, be straightforward, be honest about what your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are, and see if you can provide data that can underscore your belief. Um, it, it, it's, it's a view of a business that includes an, an internal view, which is the strengths and weaknesses, both good and bad in your business, and an external view, both good and bad. Those things outside of your business that you don't necessarily have direct control over. What are opportunities? What are threats? Um, and the process is that you, you sit down and you list what, what are my business's strengths? Again, I wouldn't recommend this for somebody just starting out, but if you're in business now, what are my strengths? How do I know it? What data do I have to prove that I am correct? Uh, if you can do this with somebody else, not but just by yourself, maybe with a customer, maybe with a supplier, although you need to be careful about who you choose because you want to make sure that they're giving you honest opinion, but list the strengths, be honest. Um, what are your weaknesses? Be honest. Try to provide data, try to provide quantification for your beliefs and opportunities and threats. Uh, opportunity might be a new technology coming through or potentially new partners and new suppliers coming into the marketplace that didn't exist before. A threat, and it's always a threat for small businesses, who are the new competitors, particularly those businesses where the entry barriers are low. Um, consulting business, the entry barriers are very low. Uh, you don't have to rent an office. You don't have to buy a truck. You don't have to, a lot of physical assets. You can walk in, hang your shield up, start your business with little, with very low costs. That's a low entry business. It's also a, a low exit business. So uh, in a lot of your businesses, you'll find there's lots of competitors coming in, lots of competitors leaving. You just need to know who's remaining. Uh, regulation is always an, an issue, economic downturn, particularly in, the, in these COVID times. How does COVID affect your business? For how long? What are your strategies in dealing with COVID? So all of these external threats are things you need to factor in. So you list all these things. And, uh, and once you have that, you come up with things that are in your list, you're coming up with items in your list that are more important than others. So for instance, it could be that your reputation, your brand is a, a great value and you wanna make sure that you reinforce that brand. That's the most important thing you can do. Or excellent service may be the most important thing you can do. Strengths, it could be maybe your cost structure is too high and how do you whittle down your cost structure without affecting your product and service quality and delivery? Uh, new op opportunities, uh, new technologies are always, because technology is coming out all the time, uh, and threats finally, uh, competitors have already talked about COVID. So what you do is to take all these strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats and try to come up with a strategy that addresses them all. Um, and here is your first um, form to fill out. And um, I, I believe, Tim, we, we have these forms available. Um, at least I, I, I think they're online. And the, what you do is to walk through these things and say, okay, what, what are, what are, what's my market? What's the customer trends? What, what are the competitive trends? What's, how's my business doing? What's not working? And all that helps you to put together what amounts to a market positioning statement. You understand where you are, what you do, and have a 
rough idea of what your business strategy is going to be. So that's the first step. The second step is defining your market position. Um, I'm gonna repeat myself a little bit here, but uh, I'll get into more detail. So marketing, this is an old uh, acronym, five, the five Ps, I'll, but, and there are other letters you can use to describe marketing, but uh, they're all the same. First of all is positioning. What's your target? Who are your competitors? What's your advantage? Uh, you must have an advantage. Otherwise, why would people wanna buy from you? And it's important that you articulate what that advantage is. What's your product and service? Um, the, one of the problems I see with uh, people just starting a new business is they haven't defined their product or service precisely enough. And that's particularly true of service businesses. Uh, they, you also need to make sure you understand that you shouldn't do too much. Uh, if, if eventually you wanna say offer uh, a, uh, a complete line of jewelry for all ages, you may not wanna start out with a complete line of uh, jewelry. You may wanna define or start out with a product that meets the needs of a particular segment that's easiest to find or has the greatest value in what you offer. Pricing is one of the most difficult things you can do in marketing, and everybody has a challenge in pricing, even existing businesses. What are you going to charge? And uh, there's a strategy associated with pricing. You want to make sure that your strategy allows for you to make a margin, to make money. If, if you're the low price guy, you better have a cost structure to support that low price strategy. Otherwise, you'll lose money and be out of business soon. Every, I think every product, every business can price their products at a premium. It might be a penny, it might be a lot of money, but it, there ought to be a premium associated with, associated with their pricing, which is why it's useful for you to review uh, your competitors and what they're doing. Place has to do with distribution channels. We talked a little bit about that and I'll talk more, um, but there are various ways to distribute. The internet is, a, is certainly one way to, to find customers. It may be another way to convince those customers. It may be the entire channel you use. So there are businesses, uh, retail businesses primarily, that sell everything online, everything. Uh, you, you, you go there to, you find it, you go there, browse to shop, you select, uh, you pay, and the only thing that's necessary is that it needs to be delivered. But the, the internet is the primary distribution channel. It could be the internet is nothing more for you than a, uh, an, an electronic brochure. All it does is to give you legitimacy. People are not gonna find your, your internet site. You're gonna have to help them find it. Uh, once you identify who they are, once you convince that you're worth talking to, the internet provides you with some credibility. Oh, they have an internet, internet site. Oh, I see. Oh, they have pictures here. I understand better. It just helps you confirm in the customer's mind that you are a legitimate business. Um, catalogs and brochures are another way of touching customers. It, it could be, and I, I usually recommend this for many of my small, my startup business clients. The best thing you can do in a distribution channel is use your network. Uh, call people up you know. Let them know that you're in business. Ask them if they know of people who might be interested in what you offer. It's cheap. It, it's only your Rolodex. It's only your, your contact, uh, name of contact list. So use it and it, you'd be surprised the extent to which you can be successful, at least initially, that it doesn't go, uh, it doesn't go forever, but Eventually, not only this this uh, th th this uh, this collection of contacts you have could become customers, and they tell other customers, and that becomes a, a a word of mouth business, which has its own value. It may not be the only way you want to get new customers, but it's certainly a valid way and one that you want to try and and uh, uh, and develop promotion. Uh, advertising, PR, all of these things are part of uh, promotion. The most important thing I would stress to any business, 
whether you're in business now or just starting up, is putting together a marketing message. What am I saying about my business? Is it understandable? Do people know what I'm talking about? Do people find themselves interested in learning more? Uh, that marketing message is tricky. Uh, and sometimes it takes businesses a while to get to the right marketing message. And don't feel defeated if you can't come up with the right pristine, clever marketing message initially. It takes a while. And by the way, your customers can help you with that marketing message, particularly if you're in business or if you're just starting out, friends of yours, you know, who know you and know your business, ask them to tell you what they think of your business. That could be a basis for your marketing message. Um, this, is, uh, this is the segmentation piece I was talking about. Every business has a, a segmentation. Um, I will be... Uh, rather crude in my example, but let's just say you're a restaurant. You're an Italian restaurant and you have a pizza business uh, and you also serve customers uh, in, in your establishment and you also deliver other dishes besides pizza. Well, the pizza customer is gonna be different from the customer who wants to uh, wander into your, your, uh, your restaurant, sit down and have a meal. They may differ by their uh, demographics um, could be that the pizza delivery customer is younger. It could be that you get a lot more orders during sports events. It could be that your in-person restaurant service is for older customers who like particular kinds of dishes, but try to figure out what that looks like. And every business has got segments. These segments differ slightly in in the value they they. Uh, ascribe to your business, in their hot buttons, in their price points, understand what they are. And then uh, as you're starting out, try to go after the easiest one first, but recognize that you're gonna have to expand your business to serve them all, because that's what you're in business for. You're in business for growth. You start out with one segment, you keep adding segments, it grows as you add segments and as you add marketing messages associated with that segment. Uh, psychographics is a fancy word for what, what's the ego involved in making this decision. Uh, a good example is the car business. So um, some people buy, as an example, um, BMWs or Mercedes because they're well engineered and they look nice. And that's true. But many of them want to buy a BMW or a Mercedes uh, because it gives them status. They like the idea of driving around in a BMW or a Mercedes. So uh, factor that psychographic into your ads. You'll notice, for instance, in, in Mercedes uh, ads, they always picture wealthy, confident people driving around in, in, their, in their cars with sunglasses on, the wind blowing through their hair. They're just uh, having a ball. Why? Because they're in a BMW. They, they like it. It makes them feel good. So there's probably a psychographic element to most of your consumer businesses, less so in business to business. And then again, uh, we've talked a little bit about this. What are your distribution channels? Who do you sell to? How do you get to them? Um, a, a short view, uh, statement on this, uh, what's your niche? What's your competitive advantage? Why do people buy from you and not from somebody else? And it could be a variety of reasons and make sure that you, that you factor in all those reasons because some of your customers may, may value one or two reasons at the top. Another customer might value a, a, a reason down below, say service or speed or location. Make sure you understand all of those advantages and try to market yourself consistent with those advantages. Um, this is something I've done. I'm not sure how useful it is, but I, I like to, to rank my customers in terms of their, uh, their, their business usage. There are growth customers. Usually those growth customers, by the way, are beyond the reach of somebody who's just entering the business, but that may be the aspiration. You may want to ultimately find your way to those customers who are both profitable and who are growing. Either those businesses themselves are growing or there are more and more businesses that are in there. Uh, there are bread and butter customers, those customers who will come to you, uh, whether you 
tell them about your business or not, word of mouth, uh, they, uh, they trust you, you're, you're reliable, they're going to come back and do business with you. Uh, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time marketing to these people, but you certainly want to make sure that you're pleasing them. Um, there are stepping stone customers. Uh, the best example I can think of is uh, the uh, construction business. It may be that you are uh, you want to offer a general contracting business, but you're just starting out and you, you just have to find customers interested in a particular service. You may want to start out uh, marketing your roofing business or your patio business, recognizing that it, a happy roofing customer may very well want to graduate to a customer who wants you to redo their basement or to build a wing or whatever. Don't, uh, don't ignore those early on customers who might become different kinds of bigger and better growth customers in the future. And then finally, there are undesirable customers. Uh, one of the problems associated with just getting into business is you don't know who these undesirable customers are. But generally, they are customers that argue with you on price or pick you apart on service or make your life miserable. They're never satisfied. So you don't need them. As a matter of fact, you may want your competitors to serve these businesses, but recognize that you don't necessarily want to serve everybody, just the ones who you can satisfy in a way that's profitable. So uh, here's a, a, a form on your positioning. Who's your target, your competitors? What are your competitive advantages? Uh, the next step, not necessarily for people just starting out, although I will try to apply some, some guidelines to that, is wh what are your sales and earnings goals? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to earn just a little bit of money to get by uh, for the weekends? Are you, you want to make this uh, big enough so that you can earn a nice, comfortable living? Do you want to grow to be the giant on the block and bury all your competitors? Well, okay, well, what's that look like in terms of sales and earnings? Um, I would recommend, and this is true for current businesses, uh, many of my current business clients don't forecast. It, it's not hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you've been in business for a while, you can probably do it relatively quickly. For those of you just starting out, it may be because you don't know, I uh, just, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what kind of sales I can expect, but the exercise is to guess. Because if you guess, you can understand over time whether your guesses are wrong or right, and you can get better at it. So if I'm looking at sales, how many things am I selling? How many widgets, how many shoes, how many bracelets? How many hours of work am I selling? How many projects am I selling? Uh, and how do they differentiate in terms of their price points? Um, so, and I know it's hard, but if, if you have, for instance, uh, a, uh, uh, a jewelry line, you, you may have certain categories of jewelries, jewelry that are meant for teenagers. I'm making this up. Uh, and the, the average price of those, of those, that jewelry is going to be a certain amount. Well, what is it? Uh, can you estimate it? And how many things are you going to be selling at that price? And then how often? When you're first starting out, you're probably not going to have any sales for the first month or even quarter because you're still trying to market yourself. You're still trying to establish your position. So don't expect you're going to get sales early on. But do expect later on, you're going to start getting sales and the sales are going to increase over time. How much of an increase? You don't know. You've got to guess. But guessing is better than not doing it at all. This is an exercise in goal setting. And, and when you set a goal and you're wrong, then you have to figure out why. And then your guessing gets better and more precise. You probably also understand your direct costs. I'll get into this a little bit more in the P&L. But what are the costs of the, your delivery service. Uh, how much does your furniture say cost to buy? And how much does it cost to ship? And what labor do you have to provide? Those are all what I call direct costs. They are related to a particular transaction, a particular sale. 
indirect costs are not related to a transaction or a sale. They're ongoing expenses like rent or like utilities. Um, so try to do the best you can in doing this. One of the things that a SCORE volunteer can help you with is putting together these projections. You, she are going to be guessing, but you're going to be guessing and then you're going to learn from that guess. And this, the SCORE volunteer, by the way, will have more experience in the industries and be able to help you maybe guess a little bit more precisely. An action plan. So now that you've got your targets, now that you understand what you expect sales to be, what's your action plan? What are you going to do to achieve it? What are your priorities? It could be your first priority when you're starting out is to let people know that you're in business. Call your friends, call people you know, and tell them you're in business. Um, get their reaction uh, and, and formulate your marketing strategy accordingly. Or it may be that you're formulating what you're gonna sell. Uh, it may be that you wanna try to sell a certain kind of consulting service, but you're not exactly sure what and to whom. And calling these people are gonna be, be better be able to help you define what you're going to do. It's free. You're not, you're, you're not selling anything. You're asking. It's market research. And the more market research you can do, the better, the better understanding you're going to have in how to run your business. So there's going to be priorities. It could be if you're in your business, your cost structure is too high. Well, why is it high? What are the big cost items that you need to reduce? How are you going to do that? It could be, as an example, if I'm in the uh, shoe business, it could be that, um, that my supplier is charging too much. I can find another supplier. It could be if I'm starting out and I, I don't have uh, the, the, uh, the, the supplier, the, the buyer power that I might later on, it could be I might have to find a supplier who, uh, who gives me product at a relatively high price only because my volume's not high. And over time, maybe my volume gets better and bigger. My price can either come down with that supplier or I can find another supplier who's eager to, to, uh, to do business with me at those volumes. All those things are an important part of what you do. Figure out your priorities. Who's going to do them? Most likely it's you if you're going to start out. By when? If you're going to do this, set yourself a deadline. Otherwise, you you'll never get it done, or you won't get it done with the, the alacrity and, and the quality that you need. And finally, what costs associated with this? It could be this is a relatively costly thing, maybe important, but you have to weigh the advantage of, of, of what you get out of this with its cost. And it could be that based on cost, the priority falls to the bottom of the list. That doesn't mean it disappears. It just means that you have to wait until you're ready and able to deliver against this priority. Uh, operations, uh, these are uh, usually for uh, people in business, but people uh, just starting out need to think about that too. Where are you going to find your product? What kind of help are, are you going to need? How do you manage your quality control and customer service? How about your billing and accounts receivable? Do you need office space? Where? And what about technology? Uh, do, are you employing the best technology? What does it cost? When can you utilize it? All of that is an important part of operational analysis. So uh, we're at the last few steps, um, the P&L and the cash flow projection. I'll just briefly touch on that because I think I only have a few more minutes before questions. Uh, the P&L is structured pretty much like any P&L. So uh, at the top is your sales revenues. Uh, it could be uh, that you have discounts and alliances. It could be that you sell and charge taxes to your customers. Well, you want to factor taxes out to determine what your net revenue is, or you want to factor out discounts or allowances. But you have a net, a net revenue figure. And then what are your cost of goods sold or cost of sales? This is the cost of delivering your product, direct cost on a transaction basis. In the service businesses, this is known as cost of sales. If you're selling things, then it's cost of goods sold. But either way, you have your net sales revenue, you subtract your cost of goods sold or cost of sales, uh, and then you come up with a gross profit. Sometimes it's called gross margin. This is, this is the basis of your profitability. 
and your target ought to be somewhere in the 50% range. It varies by industry. Construction business has a much lower gross profit expectation than the consulting business, but 50% is probably a good start. And then you subtract your operating expenses and you come up with your pre-tax profit, your taxes and your after-tax profit. That's, that's what the P&L looks like. And um, as an example, if you wish to have a 10% profit, you better make sure that your cost of goods sold is 50% of your revenues and your operating expenses are going to be uh, 40% of your revenues in order for you to get a 10% profit. This allows you to understand just how uh, well you are managing your costs. It could be a revenue problem or a pricing problem, but at least you understand in looking at the P&L, what is working for you from a financial point of view. There's also the cash flow statement. Some people don't see, uh, uh, some people don't recognize that there's, uh, there's a difference between cash flow and, and P&L. Um, in some cases there are not, but for the most part there is. And why? Because P&Ls are usually done on an accrual basis, which means that you recognize the sale when you actually deliver the good, actually get the commitment. Then you recognize it as a sale. You haven't gotten it as a cash, you recognize the sale and later you get the cash and that's where the cash flow projection comes in. Some businesses are cash only, in which case the difference between the P&L and the cash flow statement is minimal. Although if you buy stuff, you may not pay for it immediately. You may pour, pay for it later, but usually in every business has some difference between the P&L on the one hand and the cash flow statement on the other. What's a cash flow statement look like? It looks like your checkbook. You start with cash on hand at the beginning of the month. You figure out what comes in in terms of sales or accounts receivable. You figure out what goes out in the way of uh, purchasing items, rent, whatever. And you, you, sub you, you take uh, cash on hand plus receipts minus cash out. And that's what you, uh, what you have at the end of the month, cash on hand. That cash on hand at the end of January becomes the cash on hand at the beginning of February and so on and so forth. It's important you understand cash flow because if, if, if you uh, reach the end of a particular month and you got a negative cash flow, that means cash has got to come from somewhere. It's not going to come from your business. It's going to come from a loan or your savings or something. And understanding what that cash flow looks like is an important part of planning. You also will know the deviations from month to month in cash flow. Uh, some businesses are seasonal. So your cash flow is going to be positive, greatly positive in the summer, and maybe greatly negative in the winter. And the question is, how much cash do you have in the summer and can it tide you over until the winter? Understanding all those, those monthly and regional differences is an important part of the cash flow analysis. So there you have it, <clears throat> six steps. Pick one, pick two. You don't necessarily have to pick them all and they don't have to be in a fancy binder uh, to share with somebody else unless you're looking for a bank loan. And that's a subject, by the way, of another uh, a workshop. But it, it needs to be something, needs to be documented and it needs to be something you can use and something you return to, to understand, first of all, what you thought at the start and what do you think later on? That's what I have to say. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks, John. We'll yep. now use the remaining time for questions and answers. Uh, we'll take as many as possible to one o'clock. So please submit them via the chat feature in the lower portion of your screen. And uh, for those of you not familiar with SCORE, our flagship live workshop, if we ever get back to uh, doing live workshops, is actually a six night uh, program on uh, developing your plan. And John just did an excellent job in synthesizing all the important points down to a, a one hour program. So thanks, John. John, there is some question. A couple of them are actually in the beauty area. Uh, okay. Gabrielle was was asking if, if you could you know try to use an example of a hair salon booth rental as an example of how you would uh, you know develop these the plan. OK. <clears throat> Uh, I, I take what you mean, Gabrielle, is is if you have a chair in a larger salon, is that right? 
uh, let's assume that. Let's assume that you are renting some space, either with other hairstylists or uh, your own. Um, the question, uh, a question becomes, well, who are, you, who are you doing the business for? Is this for <clears throat> young women? Is this for older women? Uh, what kinds of styling might you want to consider doing? Uh, what are your prices? How, how fancy do you want to get? I've known some stylists that uh, spend a lot of money on the look and feel of the place because it makes their customers feel like they're worth it. Uh, I don't know if that's something you want or you're just looking for somebody who wants to come in, get their hair styled and get out. Nothing fancy, but workmanlike. So determine what it is you want to do, who your customers are, what your prices are going to be, and then try to anticipate over time, what does that look like in terms of profitability? What kinds of sales can you expect? And how does that affect your marketing message? Uh, the marketing message for younger women is very different from older women, who, by the way, may want to hide gray hair or who, who may have thinning hair and may want to, to a, a style that conceals that. Um, you may want to find certain kinds of styles for younger women that uh, a certain classification of woman might like. So athletes might be different, for instance, than <clears throat> those attending a prom. So understand who your markets are, uh, what your customers are, and what kinds of services are go you're going to deliver differently for those customers, and then how does that affect your marketing message? Right. Uh, the second one was from uh, Preci, uh, who is a business owner, uh, Lynn Beauty Supplies. Uh, she says she's in the retail beauty supply business. Since COVID-19, we've been exposed to all kinds of risks. Even my business skills can't help. So as business owner decision make, uh, in the case of this pandemic, do we have to guess or, or improvise day by day in terms of projections, I guess? Well, the answer, the short answer is yes. <laughs> this is this is a tough time for everybody. Nobody anticipated the coronavirus. Uh, nobody knows exactly how long it's going to last and how long they're going to last. <clears throat> so, if I'm in the beauty supply business, uh, I, I want to try and and focus on products that stress safety or may stress uh, the ability to comfort people as they're going through the, the, the virus. Or you may want to market your products as comfort products. Uh, gee, you're in the house all day and you must feeling bad. Why not look better? Why not make yourself the way you really want, want to be and buy this product? Or uh, I, I, may, I may have a, uh, a, uh, a, a hand cream that's also a hand sanitizer or I can mark it as something that protects me from the coronavirus. I'm making this up, I don't know. But what you have to do is understand what people are going through with this virus. How can I reposition my products? Can I sell new and different products to this market as long as it lasts? Um, and how does my market message work? Yeah, okay, Tamara, one. <laughs> Want to know how long should it generally take to complete a full business plan? And uh, I've run into this before where people do seem to get bogged down in the market research end or whatever. Yeah. And they seem to be spinning their wheels. Uh, you know, this is this is one of the, the temptations when you're starting your business is to do market research forever. Uh, there are two problems with that. One you've already mentioned is that it's a forever time. You never get to your business. <clears throat> but this, the first and real problem is you want to do enough to have a better sense of what the business is, but get in the business. You're going to make errors, but you're, the errors you're going to make are only errors you're going to experience <clears throat> by being in the business as opposed to doing the research. So <clears throat> market research is great. I wouldn't spend, for most businesses, I wouldn't spend any more than a month working on it. At the end of the month, you can say to yourself, I know enough. And by the way, I, I, I'm here to tell you, I've told many of my clients, you know enough, <clears throat> get in the business. That's the only way you're going to learn. Right. 
Jeffrey was uh, curious uh, on your opinion. Is it is it better to set up my LLC now and get going, or wait till the pandemic gets under control? I plan to do weddings and drone photography. Um, so I would recommend getting into business now. Set up your L LLC now. Uh, th that way you you have all that that legal stuff behind you. You may also be able to have uh, some kind of an accounting system in place. And uh, uh, the, the, the virus is not going to last forever. Uh, there's, there's some belief the virus, that, that the fears around the virus are going to subside sometime in the late second quarter, third quarter of this year. Well, be prepared for that. Make sure people know who you are. Um, events like weddings are planned in advance. I don't know that there's a lot of weddings during the coronavirus, but there will be, there'll be a, a ton of them once the fears of the coronavirus have subsided. And you wanna make sure that people know who you are. Uh, that you can use word of mouth, you can use your network to begin establishing yourself. Don't be afraid to do that. And you may learn more about, first of all, what, what the market really is like. It could be that people are, are having events in their homes uh, in, with safety, but you won't know until you actually start. So set up your LLC, sell up your accounting system and start marketing yourself and be prepared for the business. If, if not, not now, then certainly in a few months. Okay, and Bruce was, uh, <clears throat> he was wondering if these checklist reports templates <clears throat> are available in PDF or, or editable templates. Uh, I would say a lot of there's a lot of templates uh, on the score site. It's it's actually in a tile in, the, in our main page. It starts off with frequently asked questions and tools or something like that. And if you click in there, there's all kinds of Word documents, Excel documents for business plans, marketing plans, uh, doing financial projections. And um, <clears throat> if, if anything that John showed you today is, is not there, you can feel free to go back and, uh, and, and view this. Uh. And Tim, I, I think I can, uh, th yep. these forms are in, uh, in their native form, uh, either Word or uh, Excel. And we can post them on the SCORE website if you would like. Very good. Okay, so that's all the time we got for now. As a, as a reminder, the recording of this webinar is available <clears throat> within a couple of days on the Fairfield County site. <clears throat> Please check our website for information on upcoming webinars. <clears throat> Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling. So uh, please visit our website and click request a mentor. We are available for sessions via phone, email, or video. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. In closing today, a big thank you to John Harmon. Thanks, John. You're welcome.